Hello and welcome everyone. This is Rachel Paul with IAAP and we are excited to have you joining us today for our first webinar in a series of three where we are highlighting the ICT Educational Global Innovation Awardees. And before we get started, just a few items I wanted to go over. All attendee lines are muted just to prevent any background noise or disruptions. Closed captioning is available. You can select the closed captioning icon in your Zoom, in your Zoom on, your, on the bottom of your screen. And also in the chat, I just posted a third party link for third party captioning if you prefer that. We will be taking some questions today and you are welcome throughout the webinar to post your questions in the chat or in the Q&A box and we will get to those as we can. We may also uh, have questions that we'll hold and post in a Q&A section uh, afterwards for everybody to access. Today's webinar will be recorded and made available through our YouTube channel that we will send out that, that information and you can access it afterwards. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Michael to do further introductions and to kick us off this morning. Thank you, Rachel. This is uh, Michael, Michael Fembeck from the Zero Project. Um, uh, on my behalf, I'm welcoming you to this uh, first uh, webinar on ICT innovations related to education. We are glad and honored that we could join forces with uh, G3 ICT and IAAP uh, to um, start this uh, interesting new uh, webinar series. Um, G3 ICT and, and the Zero Project are related in, a, in, in the same belief, in the belief that uh, the power of, of innovation is, is, is a driver for change. We know each other for roughly 10 years and um, um, work together in, in, in several formats and several conferences. We, we uh, think along the same lines. So it was quite natural that in these new times, uh, this new life, we also thought of, of um, joining forces and creating of course, another innovation, a new innovative format, how uh, to share, how to spread uh, the news about exciting uh, new innovations that are related uh, to ICT and education. Imagine this uh, as if you are in, um, um, a, a dedicated viewer of, of, of TV series. This is uh, season one, episode one. So we are going to produce in season one, uh, we're going to produce three episodes but then we will definitely learn and, and uh, to, to develop this format into new formats. We will hopefully develop new characters, new technology. Uh, we will bring in new twists and turns into the action. So uh, stay tuned. So this first, these are the first three ones uh, that, uh, that we're starting with. Um, I'm, I'd like to introduce um, two more people that uh, joined us later in the preparation, apart from the team members that you can uh, also see on the screen, uh, Seema and Rachel, that the uh, um, welcoming uh, Christopher Lee, of course, uh, the managing director of IAP and uh, of the management team from G3 ICT. Uh, we were joined by Ricardo Bahamonde, who is an international consultant in digital inclusion, who helped us develop this format, and David Baines, um, who is uh, then moderating um, uh, the, the, the whole webinar after, after my intro. Um, let me add a few words about the Zero Project. You may or may not know the Zero Project. Um, many of you will know because I, saw, I see a lot of, of familiar names here. Um, we are all about innovation. We are all about uh, finding, exploring uh, innovations, telling their stories, connecting them, uh, giving them visibility awards. Uh, so it's all on, on, on innovation. We are entering a new world because many of you know, of course, also that uh, are, are in the heart of the Zero Project is the Zero Project Conference. Um, we always thought of, of developing new, new formats that are augmenting and adding to the, to the impact we're creating with the conference. At this time, we have to do it. Uh, the, new, the new life, the new situation that uh, COVID-19 has created um, is, is, is giving us a big push into, into digitalization and we will do a lot more. And you will uh, get a lot of more from us in the next uh, six to nine months uh, on, on, on digitalization and on how to make this uh, expertise and these networks around innovations uh, more attractive and more accessible outside our classic formats. Uh, there are of course also new opportunities here uh, in this new world. Uh, for example, there are no excuses anymore. 
that distant learning is not working, that teleconferencing is not working. That's, that's the past. So everyone had to adapt and uh, this is a new situation. So the uh, educa inclusive education uh, that nobody can say this is not going to work anymore because it, 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 of course it has its problems, but there's a proof of concept now that somehow uh, it has already in a, in a crisis situation worked. So this is an opportunity for many of us um, this uh, digital learning is, is there to stay and uh, a great opportunity also to make it accessible and, and inclusive for all. Let, let me finish uh, with A, telling you that we are currently uh, in, the, in the end of, uh, of the current nomination, call for nomination of the Zero Project. This year's topic are employment and ICT. We, we are open for some 12 more days. So if you have an outstanding innovation that is related to ICT or employment, please come forward. Um, if something is um, nominated, then it's in the Zero Project system and got all the opportunities that it has that we can promote it and connect it and give it visibility. If it's nominated, then for us, unfortunately, it doesn't exist. Please use this opportunity and uh, I would like to use this opportunity uh, to give you this message. If you have any question, uh, please come forward uh, at zeroproject.org. You find a lot of information there. You find contacts and you find emails please uh, use this opportunity. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, an, a unique situation now. Technology is, is uh, even more important than in other, any, any other circumstances. So this is my, my, my kind request and, uh, and offer to you um, to work with you on, on, on nominating uh, nominations that you know of ICT and employment uh, innovations that uh, you think should be better known. The Zero Project here is, is there to support you. Let me finish with uh, <clears throat> giving you the, uh, the, the rundown of this, um, of this uh, webinar today. Um, what I did not mention so far is there's a WhatsApp group uh, parallel to the webinar. So everyone who gave us their phone number when registering has also got an invitation, hopefully for joining us in, in WhatsApp. And I see there's already a lot going on. Uh, thank you also for using uh, WhatsApp. We will, we in this case, it means SEMA will uh, especially use WhatsApp and also the chat function of Zoom for you and giving you the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, because when I'm handing over now to David Baines, uh, he will uh, have an, um, an, an interesting, he has developed an interesting format. It will be a mix of interview segments with demonstration and Q&A uh, together with uh, Brett Turner, the Vice President of Benetech and uh, Bookshare that I'm also welcoming here now. Uh, so they will run the show now and uh, it's your opportunity to ask questions. The best thing to do is ask questions on WhatsApp or ask questions on the, on the chat uh, function. Well, now over to, to David. Um, I'm just giving you a very brief um, intro to David Baines. Um, give me a second. I um, got a little lost in all my screens here. Um, so David is um, the director of David Bain's Access and Inclusion Services and was formerly a CEO at MADA at the Carter Assistive Technology and Accessibility Center, uh, then based in Doha. Uh, David is a, a long-term um, ally in, in, in promoting uh, inclusive, um, and, inclusive and, and accessible ICT. He's a perfect choice for, for moderating this session uh, today. Over to you, David. Thanks very much, Michael. That's very kind. Uh, yeah, it's a really uh, great pleasure to meet you all. Uh, I can see people are steadily uh, joining us. I'm sure there'll be a few more uh, as we go through. Um, yeah, I've, I've been working in the field of uh, accessibility and assistive technology for the best part of 30 years. And quite a long part of that, um, I was being very aware and conscious of Benetech uh, and Bookshare. And uh, more recently, I spent some time with Brad uh, in, uh, I kind of, it was Vienna or Geneva the last time we met Brad. Um, but talk, certainly sitting down and talking to Brad uh, about Bookshare, its future, the issues of literacy, uh, and where we felt the technology could potentially take us in the future. And that discussion really has helped to shape a little bit of the interview uh, that mm -hmm. we're going to do today. Um, so, so Brad, you, uh, you're responsible for creating what, what's we felt as the strategic direction uh, of Benetech Bookshare, the Global Literacy Program. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I, from memory, I think Bookshare has been around since around about 2001. I just wonder if you can just tell us, introduce us a bit to Bookshare and just explain a little about why it was set up uh, and who uses it. Sure. Um, you know, first of all, thank you. It, it's an honor to be here today. So, um, you know, Bookshare, Benetech is a different kind of technology company. We're, we're based in the Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, we have a team of engineers building technology, but, but we're different in that we're a nonprofit. And so we scale solutions for social good. Um, go, going, you know, places where other for-profit companies won't go. Um, and, and so, you know, one, one of those is in the global literacy arena where we uh, created Bookshare, which is the world's largest accessible library for people with a print disability. So it's a barrier to reading printed text due to blindness, due to low vision, due to a learning disability, due to a mobility impairment. So, so if you think about what that means, that means if you can't hold the book, can't see the book, or can't decode the book, you can qualify for Bookshare. And, and if you can do those things, you don't qualify. So it's specifically for people with a print disability. And, it, and, and David, it started with, um, with our founder, Jim Fruchterman, who was working building reading machines for the blind. And, and all of a sudden, he had this idea that he could share books based on a copyright exception. He could share books among people um, who had a print disability. And so he, he started basically a file sharing service. So it's, it's uh, Amazon um, meets Napster legally, if you will, in that, in that um, people donated their books and they were shared with other people who had donated their books. The, that has evolved now to a, you know, a pretty extensive library where we receive books from publishers. We also continue to scan books. We bring them into Bookshare. We convert them into multiple formats to support multiple different types of disabilities, whether that's for someone who's blind or visually impaired, whether that's audio for um, someone who's at a ebook karaoke format, where it's edited text synchronized with spoke with audio. And then, and then we manage membership and geographic distribution and we watermark and fingerprint books for safety, the, all, all that kind of stuff. And, and what it's evolved to is, you know, over 900 publishers donating six to 8,000 books a month. Uh, we have, you know, over 800,000 members in, in 94 countries. So, you know, with, with a collection of 800 and you know, pushing 900,000 books, 850,000 books, something like that, each of them in multiple formats, there are something like 4 million reading options for, for people with disability. Amazing. And there's, there's a couple of things you said there, which I think are really important. And I, I remember people being quite shocked when uh, a guy I worked with a few years ago uh, who was a, a wheelchair user and for years had used a huge mechanical page turner mm -hmm. uh, for books. And the amazement when realizing that books from Bookshare were things that he could use, he could have, he could have them on a phone, on a tablet, yep. uh, wh whatever he wanted. And just the, the, the liberating sense of that. So Bookshare really isn't just for people who are blind, is it? No, 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 it's, it, it, as I mentioned, it's for, it's for people um, with a mobility impairment that you that you talked about, if you can't hold the book or turn the page, um, it's for people with uh, uh, in this, that's um, a majority of our audience are, are people with a learning disability who right. see the page a different way. It's not that they can't see the page, but it's that they see the page a different way. And and so we help to code that page for them, um, whether it's through that ebook karaoke synchronized text and audio or through just audio um, so that so that they can get this, the content just like their their peers without a disability and you have a huge number of languages that you're supporting as well we we do uh, the you know 
being based in the U.S. and supporting the U.S. education system, um, it, you know, it's it's primarily English, but we have tens of thousands of books in other languages. Uh, you know, the the ones you would expect Spanish, um, German, French, Italian, um, but but we also have books in you know key swahili or filipino uh, uh you know we have thousands of books in hindi in marathi um so yeah we we support uh i think i think i saw a, a list the other day and it was 63 or 64 different languages it's impressive it's impressive and, and it's interesting because the other question i sometimes uh hear from people is that they fundamentally think that literacy is about access to traditional text, about traditional books. Um, and that someone who is listening to a book isn't really literate. That's just listening to stories. Um, how do you respond to that? Because I hear this a lot. No, I, you know, David, I hear it a lot as well. Um, and, and, and my response is, look, people, people read in different ways. Um, they, a, a, a very obvious example is Braille, right? If, if they're reading Braille, they're not looking at the dots on the page, but they're using their fingers to read it. Other people aren't Braille readers. Uh, you know, they might listen to the book, but, but it's not the act of seeing the words. It's the process of learning the content. Um, if you can't use assistive technology to read, then everybody better take their, their reading glasses off because that's assistive technology. Uh, writing a document, spell check, that's a form of assistive technology. So, so my take is not that reading is the act of actually seeing the words on the page, it's, it's the act of understanding and interpreting and using the content. Um, you know, if they read with their eyes, if they read with their ears, if they read with their fingers, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I don't care what format they read in. I, I care that they read the book and get the content. And whether that's educational content or leisure reading, you know, it, people read for different reasons and, and that's all good. It's, it's, it's that they read. Yeah. And, and I think that that idea is supporting reading in a range of formats. I have a, a, a real interest in the use of symbols that are normally used for communication. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, for people without a voice, but actually using symbols to support text and enable and empower people uh, to understand vocabulary and, uh, and words as well. Um, so I think that concept of literacy expands considerably when we, we start to do the types of things that you're talking about. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's five to 10% of the population have um, a barrier to printed text. Uh, symbols are, David, symbols are a great example, right? Where some people may have a cognitive challenge, um, but if you give them a symbol where they can't understand the series of words, but they understand the symbol, they're still, again, gathering the meaning of that book and able to process it and, and use it. Hmm. So I, I just, I, I do hear that all the time. Hey, if you're listening, it's not reading. Totally disagree. I totally disagree. Yeah, I'm with you on this one. And, and the other thing which I sometimes hear from people when they're talking this through with me, is saying, well, you know, if I can download a book and I can listen to it on my phone or my tablet, I can put it on when I'm driving and so on and so on. Um, that's just, I'm, I might as well just download a podcast or stick a audio from YouTube on or whatever. And yeah, you know, asking the question as to whether or not books are still relevant and important. There's so many other ways we can access information and get entertained, stories, as well as learning. So, are books still important? Uh, I, well, you're asking a guy who runs the world's largest accessible library of books are important. Good person that, to you, ask, in my view. Yeah, well, and, and the answer <laughs> is, is absolutely. They, they're, they're critical in so many ways. Um, you know, again, am I, you know, I, I spend a chunk of time in the car, um, and I'll listen to an audiobook. Does that does that mean I'm not reading? Does that mean I'm not enjoying a story? Um, it's it, it's a book, and 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 I can go to a book club and have a discussion about that book. Um, that you know, 
they, books are certainly still around the world, the primary educational vehicle. Um, they, they, even more importantly, I think, they are the primary form, one of the primary forms of the transmission of culture and of history of a society. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have learned that. And as we, we, we run, you know, libraries in 20 or 25 different countries, as we open those libraries, the first thing we do is look for local educational content and local folklore you know, cultural stories, stories that have been passed down through the generations that, you know, somebody's great grandmother told their grandmother, told their mother, told them, you know, and then told them it's, you know, very few people in pick a region, Africa, care about Mark Twain and his very famous American story about Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn on the Mississippi River. Not very relevant for them. They want the local content. And so that's the first thing, that's the first content that we bring in and that be, that collection becomes very valuable very quickly in in those countries so so books i think are one of the primary forms of knowledge transfer and of um of enjoyment and 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 passing that local history that really critical local culture from generation to generation and i i certainly found um when I was working in the Middle East, yeah, the, the, uh, the people who we were talking to, they wanted the latest Harry Potter book because they'd seen the film and they'd fancied the idea of reading the book. But before then, it's just what you said, they wanted the stories that they could respond to, that they had heard when they were younger, that their parents knew, their grandparents knew, that actually as part of a society, of a community, uh, that was really important to have access to those stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But perhaps before we move on, this is a great chance for you to show us a little bit of book share in action. Um, so we're just going to break for a moment and let you just show us a few things uh, ab uh, about book share and how it works. Yeah, perfect. And, and you know, you mentioned, you mentioned Harry Potter. Let me um, just do a quick screen share here. Uh, and it's right here. So you know, here's, I, I did a search for Harry Potter um, and we have, uh, you know, 400 results of Harry Potter, which means we have Harry Potter in, in multiple languages. And then we also have, you know, here's, uh, here's Harry Potter in Spanish. And then we also relate the search terms to the author, um, to fan fiction, whatever, other, whatever else we have in the collection. And then importantly, um, you can see, and I need to move this, you can see that we have multiple formats. So if you want to download it as an audio book, if you want to download it as a Braille ready file, which can then go into a Braille embosser or into a specialized assistive technology device, if you want to download it as an EPUB and read it in, you know, either iBooks or, or an industry standard reader, or, or even if maybe it's an educational book, and you need to make some annotations on it. You can download it in a Word format. Um, so, you know, lots of different options for, um, for reading stories. And if I click read now, what that's going to do is open the book in a browser. So let me just shift over to here. And, you know, here's Mr. And Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Drive. Um, and... And so I can read it or... Mr. and Mrs. Dursley, of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. And so, so there's that, that I mentioned that ebook karaoke, highlighted words um, paired with spoken audio, whether it's a text of speech or human narrated audio. And, and in a text... Uh, the, the books that we generate are in text to speech format, but what that does is gives you the ability to change a voice. I can make it a male or a female. I can make it a different accent. I can change the voice. I can change the speed. I can change the font size. So it's a very, very customizable experience. We have a, we have a, uh, a dyslexic font, uh, different backgrounds. Uh, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have overlays, which uh, sometimes people have trouble moving 
um, sequentially from the first line to the second line to the third line to the fourth line. And so we have overlays that help their eyes track different lines. So lots of different supports that we provide for reading a book in, in a bunch of different ways, right? So again, trying to support all the different types of disabilities. If you want to read this on a phone, that's fantastic. Right now I'm sitting on a laptop. Um, you can put it on a tablet. You can put it on an MP3 player. Again, I don't care what you read. I don't care how you read. I don't care the device you read it on. I don't care if you read it with your eyes, your ears, or your fingers. I care that you read. I think that's so important. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, that's just, again, a very, very, very quick look at a tiny bit of the functionality of Bookshare. Search for a book, 800,000 of them in the collection. Choose the format open it in the way you want, whether you download it or open it in a browser and read the book. It's, it's, it's a very, very simple process. And I can remember working with you guys at one time to get this system to work uh, for Arabic speakers, because not only was it about having an Arabic voice that spoke it out, but it needed to be synced. It needed to be from right to left, not left to right. Yep. The technical challenge was, was quite significant. Um, but you did deal with it. Yep. Yeah, again, uh, multiple languages, script languages, uh, Roman characters. Um, we're, we're working on some pretty cool technology now um, using machine learning. And, and we'll talk a little bit about, about math in a, in a bit. But, but one of the things that we're, that we're doing is for those who can't get, for, for libraries like ours, around the world who can't get books from publishers um, and have to scan titles, we're working on the automated um, transformation of a scanned book, which is fundamentally an image. And so if you're blind or low vision and somebody shows you an image that doesn't help and, it's, and a scan is just an image of a page, well, then you can OCR that, but, but it gets complex. What if there are um, sidebars or callouts? Um, wh when do those get read? And so we're working on automated technology to be able to um, to do that, such that that book is the exact same experience for someone with a disability and for someone without. It, it, it interests me. I want, I want to sort of begin to explore some of the challenges that you're facing now uh, and in the future. Um, so one of the things that I think is interesting is the issue of maths and science. And with that, uh, as one of our, our, our guests has, has said, books with images and image descriptions, how big a challenge is that for you? And how are you trying to address it? You know, I and, and, I, and I alluded to it in, in, in my last comment, it's that text is easy. I, I, I'm gonna say easy in air quotes here. So, um, you know, for 20 years, we've been using optical character recognition to transform text, an image of text into a readable format. Um, I, I'd say we've largely solved the challenge of electronic text. Uh, if you uh, scan a document in many different languages into Google Drive, it will OCR that document for you. Um, and it's, you know, it's pretty accurate. Now, we, we get books from publishers, and so we get that as digital text. We get, um, but we still scan, under, under copyright law, we still scan four to 500 books a month. And even though OCR is 99.9% .9 accurate, um, we're, we proof every book because it should be a great reading experience. And I am not a criminal versus I am now a criminal. That's only one letter difference, not to now, the T to the W, but it sure means something different. Yeah. Um, just which, one, which one are you? <laughs> now not i can't remember yeah it's um, hard to tell it sometimes yeah <laughs> so but so so i so i'd submit that text is largely solved not 
a hundred percent perfect all the time. But again, we, we proof everything that we scan. What's hard is when you get into images, charts, graphs, tables, artwork, equations, formulas, sidebars, uh, you know, uh, all of that content makes a middle school science book, you know, for a, for a 10 or 11 year old, much more challenging than a uh, university or college level literacy book, literature book, right? Because there's all of that other information that that whether you're blind or low vision, you can't see the chart. If you're um, dyslexic, you might not be able to parse through a the quadratic equation in math, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, it, it, so that becomes sort of the next frontier. Um, and trans transforming STEM content, then science, technology, engineering. I'm going to call it STEAM content. Science, technology, engineering, art, and math is is, is time consuming and it's expensive. Um, you know, the, 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 the L is, um, to the right is uh, the, uh, the Mona Lisa. It's one of uh, da Vinci's most famous works. Well, what does the Mona Lisa look like? I don't know, I can't see it, right? And so the description of that becomes pretty important. Um, or, you know, uh, you know, here's the Pythagorean theorem. It describes the relationship of the legs of a right triangle image. Hmm. And, and, and someone who can't either parse through it or can't see it is completely without that content. And, and therefore the knowledge is, you know, the knowledge transfer is, is incomplete. And so what we're doing is we're going to change that. Um, we're, you know, use, we have a, we have a small team of folks working on machine learning and computer vision and natural language processing and neural networks. Some of the more advanced technologies that are being used, you know, by, by the Googles and Microsofts and Amazons. And, and we're using that same exact technology to automate the transformation of math into an accessible format. Um, so. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, and you spoke about image description. Do you do you think that AI um, and some of the automated image description systems are are part of the future going ahead? And the reason why I say this, I remember a couple of a few years ago, um, the film The Revenant was out, and uh, there was a scene in that where people are being attacked by a grizzly bear, and there was a still from mm -hmm. it. And man fights for his life against grizzly bear was automatically translated as man playing with large dog. Um, <laughs> and I think it really would have changed the nature of the story quite a bit uh, in that case. But is AI something you see as being uh, of value going forward? I, I, I absolutely. It, you know, there, this, this could be an entire new webinar series on, you know, the, the pros and cons of AI, but, but the power that it brings gives us the ability to scale um, and, and scale automatically. In some senses, even optical character recognition, remember I said we've largely solved text through OCR, that's a form of AI. Um, and, and, and so, you know, it, what AI does is allows us to take the remediation of a book from a three or four month process to eventually a three or four minute process. Um, and, and that's, boy, that's critical, right? If somebody shows up for class and they have to wait uh, a month to get a book, they're a month behind their peers. Yeah. And so, you know, I, so I think AI is, <clears throat> is very, very powerful. And, um, and we're using it in some pretty, pretty interesting ways. One of the other areas I, I, I also hear people talking about, and uh, Zainab uh, has, has asked a question related to this. Um, when people donate books, publishers submit books to be included, mm -hmm. um, what happens in terms of copyright and how do you protect their copyright uh, going mm -hmm. forward? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so, in many countries around the world, 
there is an exception in their local copyright law, their national copyright law, that allows copies of books to be made for people with disabilities, as long as it's done on a nonprofit basis. So I can't go get a book and copy it and sell it and make money off of it for, uh, whether it's for people with disabilities or, or without. But as a nonprofit entity, I can take virtually any book that I can get legally. I can't go steal a book and do it because, you know, that, that starts in the wrong way. But if somebody donates a book, if I purchase a book, if I borrow a book from the library, as a nonprofit entity, I can make a copy of that book exclusively for the use of someone with a disability and as long as it's done on a nonprofit basis. And, and that law or some some um, similar version of that law is has been implemented in 85 different countries around the world and and growing. Um, there's an international treaty now called the Marrakesh. It, it's mm. abbreviated as the Marrakesh Treaty, um, and it's been around for about five years, um, and and was about five years in the making before that. Maybe 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 it's been around for six years now. And what it does is allows it. It, for any country that signs on, it asks them to implement that copyright exception that I talked about, where you can make a copy of a book exclusively or for someone with a print disability on a nonprofit basis. And it also allows the transfer of books across country borders. So the U.S. has had a copyright exception for a long time. Um, what we couldn't do was transfer those books to another country because they in some senses, lose their copyright, their U.S. copyright protection. Now that countries have signed on to this international treaty, they agree to also protect any incoming content under this copyright exception as if it was their own. So, so all of a sudden now you have the transfer of books between countries that, um, that are available for people with disabilities. So Bookshare has books from um australia and canada and the uk and uh and ireland and the mid east and and those are all available to people with a print disability in any of these countries that have ratified the the marrakesh treaty because the books are available at, at, you know under those under those guidelines specifically for people with a print disability specifically for um specifically protected um by that copyright law and then and then, David, we go above and beyond that. You asked you ask how we protect that copyright. We, we limit our membership. We, you know, in Bookshare, um, we're a little more stringent than, than most in that we require a proof of disability for someone to get access to our copyrighted content. Um, we fingerprint and watermark every single book that goes out. So, yeah. um, so that if that book gets posted online somewhere, we not only can find the book because we have watermarked it is it with a hidden watermark we also can take that member and shut their account down for violating copyright law because we know because there's a fingerprint in the book so you know and and we search sharing sites and you know there's there's a bunch of stuff um that we do out the the general counsel of the um association of american publishers as the Marrakesh Treaty was was implemented in the United States. Said, I'm really, really glad Bookshare is involved because we've worked there for a long time and we really trust their copyright um, uh, processes. That's great. I mean, what, one of the other questions which um, uh, somebody somebody's asked, and I think it's actually an interest. I've never thought of this before. Obviously, you do a lot to allow people to access the books uh, in different formats. Mm -hmm. um, but in some places they don't have widespread access to devices. Are schools or others allowed to download and print books uh, to share for people with learning disabilities? Or is that something which uh, would become more difficult? Because how can you track what happens to that book once it's been printed? Right. So, so not allowed to print them unless it's in Braille. Right. Um, 
because and 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 Braille is treated interestingly. Braille is treated pretty differently. It's an incredibly specialized format, obviously, and um, and so publishers are a little bit less worried about a copyright um, um, violation if it's a Braille book. So we do allow a Braille book to be downloaded in and run through a Braille embosser um, and provide, and then people have a, a hard copy Braille book. Um, other books um, that's, that's against the regulations um, and, and if you're gonna spend the money printing a book, go buy the book. <laughs> um, because remember, it's a print disability. So a printed version doesn't really help. If it, if it does help, then you shouldn't be part of Bookshare. And if it, um, and, you know, and so, so essentially it's, it is against the law. Um, but for a disconnected operation, there are a, a number of different ways that we allow you to access that content. So you can read it online. I just showed you a browser-based version of of Harry Potter, but you can also download it to a mobile phone. You can also uh, download it to your computer. If you don't have access to any of those, you can download it to an MP3 player and just listen to it. Uh, one of our partners, Vision Australia, has developed a device that um, is a player with a solar charger on the back. Assuming that there are a number of people in rural areas that may not even have access to power. So they show up at the, at the village, they plug their, it's a, it's a size of a deck of cards as a player, they plug it in, they download 25 to 35 different books, unplug it and walk, walk away. They don't ever have to even plug that device in um, because they can flip it over, charge the battery with the sun, plug their headphones in and listen to those books. So lots of different ways we've worked to support both the, the rural and disconnected population, as well as, of course, the broadband population. Uh, and so there's a couple of interesting things which I think are really important. I think you've sort of explained really well how you protect publishers, but the importance of print. Um, but I know from countries that I've worked in around the world uh, uh, over the last uh, couple of years, the idea of proof of disability can be really challenging to get. Many, many young people don't have a diagnosis that is meaningful. What do you accept as proof of disability? Mm -hmm. so, so we stratify our collection. Um, our, with the relationships that we have with the publishers, we have a um, a pact that says that we will collect a proof of disability. And so, um, and so that proof of disability comes from uh, what I'll call a trusted authority. And, and that's someone and, and, and a professional with the expertise in making a determination whether they have a disability or not. It's certainly a medical doctor qualifies, a reading specialist qualifies. Someone who um, is, you know, for example, a, a trained librarian can qualify. Mm -hmm. We're looking for um, something more than, you know, a mother's note. Hey, Johnny's struggling with reading. Well, Johnny might struggle with reading because um, he's, you know, has, um, you know, he's learning a new language. And, and that's a challenge. And you struggle with reading when you learn a new language but it's not a disability that affects your use of any language of any book. And so, so um, there's, there's two ways that we allow people access to our books. Some of them are, are allowed access to our scanned content based on the authority of a library or um, a, a special, one of these special nonprofit organizations in another country. Um, others to get access to our publisher content, you have to submit a proof of disability or have a trusted authority tell us that they have a copy of a proof of disability. So again, copyright law is really, really, we take it to heart. It's very important to us. Um, and so our protection for the publishers is 
you have to prove to me that you have a print disability and then you can have all the content that you want. Um, but, but, you know, we have worked with folks in the past who um, have said, you know, we, oh no, for sure. We promise that this person has a, has a disability and we do a little bit of investigation and they're just trying to get free content and we don't allow them access. And you do have some books in there which are under open license, don't you? So for people, we, before we can't, I remember working with some elderly people and actually what they wanted was classic literature. Um, yep. And some of those are available for people, perhaps older users, people who read before. Uh, they are available through books. It's not just the latest books, is it? No, it's, I mean, again, you know, 850,000 books, you're going to get, you're going to get a lot of different content. We have seven or 8,000 open access titles, whether they're creative commons or out of copyright. Um, and, and some of the classics fit into there. Um, we have the latest books the same day they're released, uh, you know, in bookstores and on Amazon. Um, so we get early releases of those books with an embargo on that book to say, you can't release this until, you know, Thursday the 13th or whatever it is. Right. Um, so, so that, you know, if, if someone with a print disability wants to join a book club and that book club is reading the latest book, they don't have to wait two months to get that, to get that book. They get the book the same day as everybody else gets the book and can enjoy it or learn from it or discuss it or utilize the information in, in whatever way they want. I think, I mean, we're, we're it's really sad. I can't believe we're, we're beginning to come towards the end uh, of this session now. It's flown past, Brad. But uh, I've, I've just seen a great question. It's something which I've um, been thinking about recently. Somebody said there's currently no presence of book sharing in Central and Eastern European countries. Looking ahead, are you planning to expand into more countries in the future? You, you know, we are actually in the process, and I, and I wish we had started this earlier in our life, um, but we're in the process of, of starting to open libraries and, and run national libraries for a country that doesn't have access to the technology. Um, and so we'll go into a country and work with the Ministry of Culture and work with the Ministry of Education. Remember I talked about the culture, the local folklore and culture, as well as the educational books. So we'll work with both of those entities of the government, as well as the blindness organization or, you know, a local NGO, disabilities NGO in that, in that, in that country to set up a library and get the local content as well as add the international content that we have so that people in uh, in Kenya, in um, Tanzania, in uh, Bolivia, in Nepal, can can get access to accessible content. Um, and you know whether we're powering very very large libraries, uh, you know Bookshare, you know libraries in Australia and Canada and the UK and in Ireland and you know whether we're powering libraries like that or whether we're powering a library like Kenya Bookshare or, or uh, Bolivia Bookshare, that, you know, it's, again, it's trying to get, give access to as many eligible people as possible around the world. Uh, listening to you, you know, Brad, I, I, I get this, uh, this sense of the pride you feel in what has been achieved so far, mm -hmm. and clearly with, with very, very good reason. But we spoke a little bit about how information is diversifying, it's available in so many different formats now. What's the future for Bookshare looking ahead? You know, to, there, there's, it's a, it's a two-part answer. First of all, we're working to change the way publishing is being done. Um, the, the, the publishing industry released about a million books a couple years ago. Bookshare 
put about 100,000 books into the collection. And, and to give you some perspective, when we talk about scalability, and, and you asked about artificial intelligence, and, and I said, you know, it really helps with scale. To, to, to give some perspective on scalability, um, most of the other libraries around the world who, who transform books into accessible formats put one to 2,000 books into their collections. We put 100,000 books. And we put them in, in five different formats. So we put 500,000 reading options into our collection where other people put, you know, one to two to three, maybe 4,000 different reading options into their collection. So our scale is dramatic. And yet the publishing industry put a million books out there. So we fell 900,000 books behind. And, and you know, that's a, it's, a, it's a painful reality right now is it takes time and money um, to convert all these titles. And so the first thing the future holds for us is that we're, we're actively working with large publishers to get them to publish in an accessible, in an accessible manner. So we have a program called Global Certified Accessible that is, is working on systemic change in the publishing industry. And we're, it's, it's, it's a collaborative process. We're helping them by tearing apart their ebook, giving them a report back on saying, hey, these are the things that are great and these are the things that need, you, know, you need to work on accessibility in this book. And then they fix their processes and send us another book and we look at it again. And, and so pretty soon we get, we're starting to see books that are completely accessible coming out of the publishing industry. And, and we give them a certification so that they can then go promote to this 5%, 5 to 10% of the world's population, they can promote that their books are accessible and, and people buy that book. And so they get better market share, they have a larger total available market, and it's a, it's a better solution for uh, people with a disability. So, so that's the first thing, and you know, in, in some day long in the future, I hope to put Bookshare out of business by doing that, because if every book gets published in an accessible fashion, then we don't need to convert anymore. And I can take my super talented team and go solve another challenge. Um, we're, we're a ways away from that, but that's the first thing. But I, I, and I, I think the second thing is, you know, we mentioned earlier, I would love to connect with other global NGOs and other disabilities um, sooner. Um, you know, they, a, a lot of these other NGOs and, and, even, and even governmental organizations um, have the connections and have the reach and have the funding. And, and I think we're just scratching the sur surface of what we can do in the broader international community. And we combine that reach and funding with the technology and sort of the grassroots credibility that we have. You know, I think for, for providing solutions to some of the bigger challenges we're facing, you know, the, the, the access to content, the conversion of not just text, but the STEM or STEAM topics, whether it's, you know, math, which is the stuff we're working on right now, but, but that will move into physics and chemistry and, you know, the engineering and, and art and, you know, there's, there's, there's so many things that we can, and, and people with disabilities around the world should, should benefit from that. A couple of quick questions I want to ask you, because looking at some of the comments from people, I, I think you've inspired people to think that there is more that they could do, the more that they want to do to promote literacy, to promote books, for all, for inclusive. And at one end of the market, somebody, uh, uh, Lamis from Egypt said, I've got one book which we would like to uh, make available in different formats. How would we do it? How do, how do we start? If we just have a, a small pub, we've got one book we've published in Arabic, how could we contribute it? Yeah, so, so we have a group of folks who work with publishers from all over the world. Um, and, and you can send it, a message to international at bookshare.org and say, I want to contribute my title. Um, and, 
and we'll work with you to make sure it's in the format that we can accept. Um, you know, we, we take books in a number of different formats, but there are obviously some that, that are more challenging. And so we'll work with you to make sure it's in that format. Um, and then we'll add it to the collection. And depending on the distribution rights, um, we'll make it available in your home country. Or if you say, no, I have global distribution rights, we'll make it available on the world. Or you say, no, I only want to make it available in the Middle East. We'll make it available in the Middle East, right? So, so we have the ability to, to limit geographic distribution. We will put the book in the collection. We'll convert it into multiple formats. Um, and, and we work with a, a bunch of independent publishers and even independent authors um, to take, you know, their one or two or 10 or large multinational, their thousands of books a year um, and, and add that to the collection. So, you know, um, um, you, you know, it, it can be as easy as starting with an email. Great. And at the other end, you know, you, you, as I say, you've inspired people with all sorts of different things. You said, um, so how can we start a national library for Bookshare? Mm. Uh, send me an email. I'd love okay. to have that conversation. That's a great answer. Brad, uh, Jessica, Brad T, it's Brad T at Bookshare. Uh, sorry, Brad T at Benetech.org. Okay. And also you can, uh, you can obviously contact uh, Brad through the WhatsApp group which has been formed as well to me if uh, you absolutely didn't work that. Uh, and and again that's that's david that's that's why we show up at work every day is to help people get access to content and so if somebody says oh my gosh I, you know i'm in pick a country um and i'd love to, we don't have a national library and i or or i or i'm part of of a national library here and i'd love to add the bookshare capabilities to that you know, that's, that's the stuff that, that floats our boat. You know, we love that. I'm going to come into our last question before we close off. Uh, thank you, Rachel. She's just posted uh, your email uh, to everybody. Uh, I hope you'll get inundated. My <laughs> last question for you. Looking back at what Bookshare have done, what you've achieved, what the team have achieved, what mm -hmm. the organization have achieved, is there anything you wish had been done differently? Anything you wish you could go back and change? Yeah. So, um, I, I, again, I, I would, I would love to have gone through, um, a broader international expansion a little bit earlier. We, we started, we started doing international, um, you know, work outside the U S in 2008, maybe something like that. Um, but, but partnering with, NGOs around the world is a really, really good way for us to sort of um, help people get access to our books and our technology. Um, and when we started early, we, you know, we started with a couple of people that were just traveling out and uh, trying to work with Bookshare members um, in international locations going through a partnership model is, you know, a local NGOs, local, um, even again, even local governments. That's, I, I wish we'd done that earlier. We would, we would have far more people around the world with access to, um, hundreds of thousands of books. And, yeah. and frankly, we'd have, we'd have more local language books, Latin America. You know, if you, if you put, you know, 5,000 of the most widely read uh, Spanish titles in, everybody in Latin America can read that. Everybody in Spain can read that, right? So, so th there's your kind of local folklore, your local language, the, the collection, um, the collection becomes more valuable to people. So, um, I, you know, we can still do it. We still, it's, that's a big focus. Of what we're doing now is NGO and local government partnerships to help bring Bookshare to multiple countries. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to, so I just want to say, as I say, I genuinely want to thank Brad. Um, it's been, I, I hate the word inspirational because I just hate the word, but it's been actually incredibly valuable and is genuinely inspirational to remind us of the importance of books, of literacy, if we're going to break down social inclusion for people with disabilities, 
that's going to take many, many different actions across many different domains. But the importance of literacy and the availability of books is one of the planks that we need to build upon. And what Benetech, what Bookshare, Brad and his team are doing, I think has set the scene for something which is truly important uh, for what we believe in. We do um, move on from here to two more uh, webinars uh, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, next week, at the same time, uh, Natalie from, from Dathianonthe uh, will be talking to me uh, about the free online training for professionals applying accessibility guidelines. In many ways, some of the things that Brad talked about in terms of born accessible requires people to have the skills and knowledge and understanding to make products uh, accessible from the very beginning. And I think it's a very good follow on from what we've discussed today. Um, and Natalie discusses that with us next week. And then the week after, Basilis uh, from Sci-Fi, um, I think we're gonna have a really interesting conversation around the provision and availability of free and open source electronic games mm -hmm. for children. Gaming, we talked a little bit today about how we access learning and literacy in so many different ways. For people much, much younger than me, games and gaming have increasingly become a way in which they not only are entertained, but learn as well. And I think that our, our final webinar on July the 8th, where we explore electronic, open source, accessible electronic games for children, will be another really quite exciting dimension. Um, and I want to try and close off uh, the session now uh, as we, we've reached our hour and just ask Chris or Michael, is there anything they want to add uh, to finish our session and to join me in thanking Brad uh, for being so honest uh, throughout the discussion? It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. Brad, it's been great. Thank you so much for taking the time and um, I'm really I'm thankful that you had the time to actually drill down and, and really give us a good uh, viewpoint of what Bookshell is all about. So thank you. Uh, it's, uh, again, it's it's been an honor to be here. I, if I, you know, we're at Benetech, we're very passionate about making sure everybody can read, and um, and so these are I, I you know, a, a webinar like this is a fantastic way to be able to talk about it and. And let's spend our folks to reach out to us and access to, to Bookshare. Great. Thank you. David, also thank you and um, all team for helping us pull this together. Yeah, and the thank captionist. You. Thank you, captionist. <laughs> Take care, everybody, and look forward to seeing you hopefully in a week's time for our second session. <laughs>